Welcome back to the GCN Racing News Show. Coming up this week, I'll be wrapping up the Tour of Flanders. Was Mathieu van der Poel's victory as inevitable as it seemed? And what happened to SD Works in the women's? I'll also be looking back at a stage of the Tour of the Basque Country in which three of the big four are in attendance, but we didn't get to see any of them. This week in the world of racing, we learned that even pro riders sometimes have to just get off and walk, embarrassingly, in cleats. We also learned that even if you're strong enough to win the Tour of Flanders, you might still struggle to pop open a bottle of champagne. And finally, we learnt that Mathieu van der Poel was unstoppable in Flanders on Sunday. Now you might argue, quite legitimately, that his job was made easier by those that weren't racing. Last year's winner Tadej Pogacar chose to skip the race this year, whilst Wout van Aert was taken out by a big crash on Wednesday's Dwarves Dorf London, in which he broke seven ribs, a collarbone and his sternum. An awful list of injuries that are going to take a long time to recover from. The Spring Classics are gone, and most likely the Giro d'Italia too. He's hoping he can recover in time to do the Tour de France and the Olympics. Anyway, their absence and the fact that Mass Pedersen was also nursing wounds from that same crash put an awful lot of pressure on both Van der Poel and his Alperson de Kerning team. A pressure that a lot of us thought might make them crumble. I can't remember a race so big in which Van der Poel has been such a clear favourite and that his team would be required to completely control. I have my doubts, I've got to say, that they could pull it off, but my word did they prove me wrong. If we'd have seen their pre-race briefing, I reckon 95% of the day went completely to plan. And that is so hard to do in cycling, when you're up against 20 other teams that all have their own plans in a sport where things can go wrong so quickly. They controlled the early break formation, which didn't last anywhere near as long as most people expected it to, and then used Sylvain Dillier to keep the gap to around four minutes. They got Van der Poel into prime position for the opening climbs, and then when the first anticipation move came from Uno X, it was Alperson following with Axel Laurence. And it showed us how they were going to play it. If they weren't going to try and control every move, they were going to try and follow them and get in the mix themselves. And whilst that move didn't last long, it was Matteo Jorgensen who brought it back. And that was a strange one. There was still 110 k's to go at that point, and that was one match already burnt for the American, who started the day as third favourite behind Van der Poel and Pedersen. It was those three who hit the Mollenberg hard with just under 100 k's to go, but it was over the top of that climb we had the only point in the race where Alpsin were really on the back foot. So a group containing the likes of Van Baal, Benoit, Pedersen, Narsen and Pollitt got clear. And whilst Gianni Vermeersch was also there, it felt like it was a really dangerous situation for Van der Poel. The gap went to over half a minute, but at that point, three riders from Alpsin de Koenig hit the front and started driving it. They brought the gap down far enough that Van der Poel was able to jump to the front group on the Valkenberg, effectively putting out that fire. It was at this point that a move from one of their key rivals played right into their hands. Mas Pedersen probably wanted to put more pressure on at that point, where Van der Poel had just made a big effort, so he made another move off the front. The master stroke by Alpersen was sending Vermeers with him and allowing him to ride with Pedersen. Now, initially, I thought that was a very strange decision. I mean, Vermeers hasn't really ever shown that he's likely to be able to go toe-to-toe with Pedersen over such a long, hard race, but it was genius. Had he sat on, Pedersen would likely have got frustrated and sat up, but because Vermeers rode, Pedersen pressed on, using vital energy that he should have been saving for later in the race. Either way, it wasn't the wisest tactical choice by the Dane, and he admitted as much in an Instagram post that evening. That said, I think somebody in the Lidl Trek team car should have been instructing him to sit up. It was pretty clear, pretty quickly, that that move was not going anywhere. And sometimes you need those instructions from your car when you can't see exactly what's going on behind you. But they didn't call him back, and so Pedersen spent over 30 k's at the front of the race, whilst his biggest rival sheltered in the groups behind. He was eventually caught just after the steepest part of the Quaramont, where Van der Poel put in his first serious acceleration. Not an all-out effort, there were still 55 k's remaining at that point, but enough for us to see that he was in the form that we'd all expected. The next key point of the race was the Koppenberg, the infamously steep cobbled climb on the outskirts of Aldenada. There, Ivan Garcia Cortina was out front on his own with a small advantage over the rest, but it was carnage. First, we saw the Spaniard stood still on the climb after his back wheel slipped, and then we watched him try in vain to remount and get going again. And only three riders managed to get up that climb on two wheels. Van der Poel, then Jorgensen a few seconds behind him, 
and then Pedersen. Imagine how good he'd have been without all those earlier efforts. Uh, the rest of the riders all had to get off their bikes at some point, and it really looks like a circus rather than a professional sport at that point. And it turned out that was where the race was won. Jorgensen tried to bridge the small gap, and whilst it stabilised briefly, it then quickly ballooned as the lights went out for the American. Uh, both he and Pedersen paid for their earlier efforts, gradually drifting back through the groups over those final 40 k's. At the front, Van der Poel wasn't even just edging away. Every time he looked at the time gap, it had gone up another 10 seconds to the point where he had almost two minutes advantage over everybody else at the final ascent of the Quaremont. Needless to say, he didn't relinquish that advantage, and by the finish line, he had time to post up, stop his head unit, and then raise his bike aloft in victory. His third victory at this race, putting him equal with the record set by six greats before him. He's the sixth male rider to have won the race whilst wearing the rainbow bands of world champion, and he set the record of winning the fastest ever edition, 44.5 kilometres per hour average versus the 44.1 of Pogaccia last year. It also puts him equal with Pogaccia on career monument wins. They have five each now. And there's not a lot more that you can say or do rather than applaud him. Uh, he dealt with the pressure, he used his energy wisely, and he delivered the goods, which is far easier said than done if you're a clear favourite at such a big race. So there was heartbreak for Alberto Beccio and Dylan Tunes. They'd gone clear of the rest on the outer Klausberg with 25 k's to go, only to be caught with just a couple of hundred metres to go. Uh, the man who chased them down was Michael Matthews, but his deviation from the far left of the road to the far right uh, led to his relegation by the Commissaires from 3rd to 11th. He was beaten to the line by Luca Mazzato anyway, uh, the Italian taking a surprise second place on the day for Arkea B&B Hotels, whilst UAE Team Emirates got third, fourth and fifth, with Pollitt, Biel and Morgado respectively. And Morgado is the youngest rider to have finished in the top five of a monument in 80 years. Rick van Steenbergen was slightly younger when he won the Tour of Flanders back in 1944. On to the women's now, where there was a nasty crash in the early stages of the race. Amongst those who went down there were Lizzie Dignan, who broke her arm in the fall, and Marlon Reusser, who broke her jaw, both ear canals and eight teeth in the incident. That sounds horrific. Our very best wishes to both of them in their recovery. Elisa longo Borghini also went down a little later on the run into the Molenberg, but thankfully she was unhurt and able to rejoin the main group. The big moment in the women's race came on the Koppenberg, now, there are far fewer climbs leading into that one in the women's race than the men's, which inevitably means there's a much larger group going into it. They also had even worse conditions in which to ride it, so it's impressive that more of them got up it on their bikes rather than on foot than the men a couple of hours earlier. The big difference between the two races, though, was that in the women's, every time you thought the race was over, it wasn't. Uh, Mariana Voss led over the top of the Koppenberg and pulled an elite group clear. The big surprise was that there was only one SD Works rider in there, and that was Lorena Vives. Behind, Kopecky had had to walk the Koppenberg, and we had the bizarre image of Demi Vollering riding past her while shouting some words of encouragement. Now, initially, I'd assumed that Kopecky just had some bad luck there and would be able to bridge across later, but on the Tyenberg, a few k's later, we saw she just didn't have the power that we thought she would have. Vollering was able to make it to the front group, attacking between the Klausberg and the Alda Quaramont, but it was a big effort and one that she would pay for later on. It was the lead into that Quaramont that helped define the race. Shira van Androy attacked just as Kopecky was bridging to the front group, and she quickly built up a lead of 30 seconds. Uh, Puck Peterson and Carline Swinkles both tried unsuccessfully to bridge that gap, and it looked for a while like the young Dutch woman might solo away to victory. That was until the final climb of the day, the Paterberg, where Cassia Nubiodoma and Elisa Longo Borghini powered away from the rest of the chasers. It looked a bit bizarre on first inspection. Why would Longo Borghini help to chase her own teammate down? Well, it turned out she'd had explicit permission from her DS Jerome Blylevens, and it was the best thing Lidl Trek could have done. Why? Because with Voss, Kopecky, Persico and other fast finishers in that chasing group, the risk was that Van Androy would be get caught and they wouldn't even finish on the podium. But with all three out front lacking a really fast finish, they all worked equally well together and increased their advantage steadily for the next few Ks. It wasn't a done deal, of course. Uh, there was always the chance that Nubia Doma might be able to beat both of them in the sprint. But she didn't help her own chances by doing more than her fair share of work in the closing kilometres. But Androy did a final lead out and Longo Borghini duly finished it off. Now there was a moment from the head on shot that I thought Nubia Doma was level pegging, but from the overhead it was quite clear she was beaten almost as soon as they kicked to the line. 
So, no SD Works Pro Time riders on the podium, but two from Lidl Trek. Just goes to show how quickly things can change. Longo Borghini is the fourth woman now to have won the Tour of Flanders more than once. But what's incredible is that her first victory came nine years ago. She really has stood the test of time. Behind those first three, Mariana Voss won the sprint for fourth, ahead of Kopecky, Pizza, Persico and Vollering, whilst Letizia Paternoster continued her run of good form with eighth on the day. And that wraps up the Tour of Flanders for another year. One race in which we watched history being made, another in which we had a brilliant fight right the way to the finish line. The good news, though, is that we've got the Tour of the Basque Country to watch all week, and it's now just five days to wait until a weekend in hell. Uh, the other good news is that I predicted both races correctly in our preview, so I'm now beating size 7-1 this season. I uh, basically decided to get triple points if you nail both wins on one day. I still haven't told Sai that yet, though. Uh, speaking of the weekend in hell, we have our classics and early season t-shirts and sweatshirts available to buy over at shop.globalcyclingnetwork.com. Uh, thanks again for all of your support on that front in recent weeks. It's really meant a lot to us. Uh, we'll also have our big Paris-Roubaix preview out for you on Thursday. And hopefully this time, there won't be any major crashes between recording it and the race. Uh, keep your eyes on our website as well, where we'll have another big build-up towards Paris-Roubaix this weekend, including interviews, tech, and written previews of the two races. Uh, on to the other races from last week now, and I'll start with the tour of the Basque Country, or Itzulia. Uh, the six-day race kicked off yesterday with a punchy 10k individual time trial. A much-anticipated individual time trial, since Pogaccia was the only one of the big four missing. So it's the first race in which you've seen Roglic, Vinegar, and Avonpool all up against each other this year. Except we didn't get to see much of them on that opening stage. Uh, due to the weather forecast, most teams sent their best riders off early, which meant that those three, plus the likes of Ayuso and Schelmosa, had already finished by the time TV coverage started, which wasn't ideal. Uh, the headline from the day is that Roglic is back. So after a slightly worrying Paris-Nice, in which he was a long way off where we've all become used to seeing him, he romped around the 10Ks to take a convincing stage win. And that was despite his deviation, down the deviation, which must have cost him about 10 seconds. So he lost all his speed, had to do a tight right turn on a time trial bike, never an easy thing to do, and then sprint to the finish line. Without that, his win would have looked even more impressive on the results sheet. Uh, the surprise on the day was that neither Avonapol nor Vinegar finished on the podium. So Jay Vine was the next best at seven seconds, with Skelmosa pulling out yet another impressive TT by finishing third. Uh, Avonapol had to settle a fourth on the day at 11 seconds, but a lot of that time was lost when he crashed on a right hand of very near the start. Given the time he lost there and the fact he had to ride the whole thing a little banged up, that was still a very impressive ride. Fifth on the stage was Vinegar, five seconds behind Avonapol and 16 behind Roglic. From what we saw, which wasn't loads, uh, he had quite a smooth run. He simply didn't have the power to threaten the front runners. Uh, the good news is that the time gaps are close, though, and there were no serious injuries, at least not during the time trial. Uh, one man who didn't start was Tom Pidcock, who crashed during recon. Here's what he had to say later that evening. Hey, everybody. Just wanted to say thank you for all the messages that I've got. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I won't be... I haven't started fast. I crashed in the recon this morning. The wind took me out in the no, corners in the end of the circuit and um, I've hit my hip really hard. I can't wait bear on it at all. Um, so yeah, I'm heading home now. Had some scans, they didn't show anything, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll keep it, keep uh, looking over the next few days because it uh, doesn't feel very nice. Um, but yeah, good luck to all the guys who are still racing and yeah, I'm just going to focus on recovery now. So, no broken bones, thankfully, but a big blow for Ineos and a big blow for the race. The punchy climbs of the Basque Country would have really suited Tom Pidcock, so it's a shame not to see how he'd have fared in this field. It's also a big blow for the Ardennes races to come, in which he was very good last year, of course. Now, their best placed ride on the day was Ethan Hayter, but it could have been so much better than ninth. So he was one of the only big names to start late, despite the forecast, and as such, he ended up having to ride the descent to the finish in a hailstorm. At the intermediate time check at the top of the climb, he was the closest rider to Roglic, just one second back. And given that Roglic then went the wrong way at the finish, you wonder just how close Hayter would have been to victory if he'd had the same conditions. We will never know, of course. Uh, he does have another chance today, though, in what is probably the only stage that could finish in a bunch sprint. 
Meanwhile, at Dwarsdale Flandre Flandern last Wednesday, uh, both races were affected for different reasons. That huge crash in the men's race that took down many of the big favourites and a crash between vehicles in the women's that meant the race had to be neutralised and then rerouted. Bisma Lisa Bight made the most of a horrible situation for them. So despite the fall of Van Aert, they got two riders into the race-winning move. And it was Matteo Jorgensen who went clear in the closing stages, never to be seen again. And the team did the double. Mariana Voss outsprinted Sharon Van Androoy on the sprint to the line in the women's race in what was another demonstration of power and tactical prowess. That was her 250th career win on the road, incidentally. At the Ronde de Mousgrand yesterday, Daria Pikulik of Human Powered Health took her and her team's first victory of the season. She outsprinted 20-year-old Anina Atasala of Uno X to the line. And finally, Timo Kierlich of Alperson de Koenig won the Volta NXT Classic for Malila Volta Limburg on Saturday in what was a two-up sprint ahead of Pascal Aincourt, whilst Femke Marcus won the women's. Right, that is all for this week. Sorry it's a day late, uh, but I'll be back on Thursday with our Roubaix preview show and again on Monday to wrap up everything that happened at those races. I look forward to seeing you all then, but for now, goodbye.